All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for coming this afternoon, and um, this is our last session of the day. Um, it's a good one. It's one I'm really looking forward to. We have a lot of you know great panelists up here, big time Snapstream users, and this is going to be really exciting. So, um, for those of you who don't know, I'm my name is Matt Queering. I'm our um, East Coast account executive. Working, I live here in New York, and I handle most of our um, you know East Coast business. Um, I know a lot of you, but for those who don't, you know that's who I am. Um, our panel, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we have a lot of long time, uh, long, long time Snapstream customers, and so they're going to provide a lot of great insight into Snapstream and technology, technology in general. That's what you know I'm really looking forward to. The title of our panel is "Very Stable Geniuses Present: How to Scale Snapstream." Um, so, you know, <laughs> these, uh, you know, these gentlemen have, you know, started off, you know, with small Snapstream instances. They've grown them, and we're going to really get into that. Um, I'll start by introducing all the panelists, and then we'll, you know, get into a, a chat, you know, later on. Um, we'll begin with David Hadley here at CBS. Um, David is the technical director at CBS BlackRock, the internal media department at CBS corporate headquarters. He oversees all technical operations, which includes video, editing, corporate meetings, maintaining the RF head end and distribution, running a studio, managing video conferencing for all of CBS globally, as well as Snapstream administration. Um, an interesting note about David's career was that he started his career in showbiz at Studio 54, um, the infamous and legendary Studio 54. So um, I'll let David talk a little bit about his Snapstream setup. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, we've got a bunch of different instances of Snapstream across multiple buildings um, that are being used individually by different groups of users right now. We're in the, in the midst of building a, one large cluster that's going to have all the users um, in separate groups, uh, sharing certain content and keeping their individual content separate. Uh, we have, I think there's a slide up there. Yeah, you can see. So we, I don't run all of these snap streams, but the late show, the rundown, BlackRock cluster and, and Samantha B. I administer. So right now we have all these different users who, who are kind of competitors in a way, right? They, you, Samantha B. certainly doesn't want to share their content, their secret content, with anyone else. You know, raw record. Even then, there's certain things you don't want another team to know what you're recording and why you're recording it. So most of these places are recording the same things over and over and over again. And we're, we're trying to get to a point where all that duplicate media can be kept in some sort of a community silo, but everybody can have their separate assets for themselves um, and keep them secure from the rest of the folks. And while that seems like it might be a really easy thing to do, <laughs> it's um, absolutely we're going to figure out how to do it. Thank you, David. Next up is Adam Cooper from ABC. Uh, for those of you who did not know Adam prior to today, I'm sure you do now because he's been shouting out from the audience all afternoon. But um, no, Adam, uh, he joined Disney ABC television in 2002 as a production assistant for ABC News Graphics. In 2008, he became manager technology for ABC News, focusing on graphics and off-air recording technologies. He spearheaded technology projects for um, special broadcasts, including multiple elections, inaugurations, space shuttle launches, the royal wedding, and others. A fun fact is that Adam has, is a true Disney fanatic. Um, he's actually been there more than 50 times, and he's never come back sick, so I guess, um, yeah. And Adam, if you can just walk us through your setup. Sure. Uh, thank you all. Um, I will try to be brief, as difficult as that is. Um, so our system is a little bit different uh, than some of them that you've talked about. It's probably similar to David's here is our original spec was much more of an off-air recording system. Um, we are an avid house. That is not any broadcast secret here. Um, and the original design of the system was to try and take some of those daily types of records that the shows require for um, the broadcast for the editing purposes or rolling pieces and take that out of our avid system, be able to, instead of recording, you know, thousands and thousands of hours into ISIS, be able to record it on the side and let the producers pick, you know, the two minutes that they need from that moment in time and send that into our Avid. So we have a pretty deep integration with our Avid system. The original design was very much that producers can come in, clip, and send it to Avid, and then all the craft editing happens in those environments. Um, so it does end up in internal <coughs> in the incoming folders. 
Um, and over the years, our Snapstream system has expanded and expanded and expanded as we have figured out that um, it does some pretty good Swiss Army things. Um, and as the technology has evolved, um, we have grown the system. So that's kind of the short version. Uh, the interesting part of us is that we use uh, not just the standard fees going in, we have, we're split about half of HDSDI these days. So on the dashboard where Aaron had NDI in 2110 and what was missing was Aspen, for us that's actually a very interesting conversation. Um, because as every other broadcaster in this room, everyone is frantically running to IP, and the more and the easier you can record IP, the better you are. Thanks, Adam. Okay. And yeah, it's Aspen, so two times better not to type it. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is uh, Gil Santana, uh, Director of Information Technology at Sportsnet New York. Uh, Sportsnet New York is a regional sports network and the linear TV network for the New York Mets. Do we have any Mets fans? All right, all right. Hey. Yeah. Big fan, big fan. G the Gil's been with uh, SNY since 2005, and he was a key management lead on their move from um, the Time Life Building down the Four World Trade Center. None of you have been there. Beautiful office space. Uh, maybe Gil would take you for a tour. Um, he's passionate about sports, an early adopter of all things tech, an avid um, researcher of the equity markets, and loves New York City real estate. Um, he currently lives on the Upper West Side of Manhattan with his wife, eight-year-old son, and two-year-old daughter. Um, and Gil's going to take us through his setup. Yes. So um, thank you again, Snapstream, for having me on this panel. Um, at SNY, our integration with uh, Snapstream is a, is a lot smaller. We're a regional sports network. So our use case for uh, the technology really is um, has been to basically have every single sort of like staffer at SNY to be able to like QC the content that we are creating. So we're primarily recording um, SNY 24 by 7 on our Snapstream uh, server. Um, and basically you have honor talent, um, our executives, um, you have even the engineers who do routine air checks, and even our sales team that are either clipping the content that's recorded um, and sending it out to uh, agencies. Um, we've also, as you can see, we've also integrated the uh, set-top boxes, and those are gonna be put in conference rooms and even in executive offices. So again, because they run our senior management team every, almost every day, weekly, get together and sort of, sort, uh, you know, sit together and hash out how they can enhance the product that we are distributing out to our customers. Thanks, Gil. And now last but certainly not least, uh, Dennis McMahon, Director of Information Technology at The Daily Show. Uh, Dennis manages all IT infrastructure at The Daily Show, and he's been at the show since 2010, um, going back to the days with Jon Stewart. Um, he's spearheaded Snapstream's growth at the show, which now oversees hundreds of terabytes of archival television footage. Um, an interesting um, note about Dennis's career, he actually didn't start in IT. He started in TV production on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, where he was a producer at the show. And uh, Dennis? Thanks, man. So um, uh, we have a similar setup as the rest of these guys. You know, obviously it's the Daily Show, so we're recording stuff constantly. Anyone that's familiar with the show uh, knows how important the the video that we roll in to support our stories, jokes is. You know, it's an integral part of the show. And uh, what started in 2010 has morphed into this beast of a thing I manage now in 2018 because uh, the producers at my show want to keep everything, uh, which if anyone works in technology and knows the limitations of physical space, uh, it's quite difficult. Um, so it's, it's been quite an experience learning how, how to deal with that. You know, we started in MPEG-2 and, and we still have MPEG-2 going and, and we're transitioning you know, over the past couple of years to H.264, but I have this backlog of video that just sits. And, uh, and it's been a challenge, but you know, the guys at Snapstream have been great. And the product is very impressive uh, with the way it can go through eight years of 24-7 recordings instantaneously for, for the producers. And um, it's, really, it's really changed the workflow at the show and allowed us do some really great things with what we have. Thanks, Dennis.
So let's uh, get into the discussion. And where I'd like to start is, um, you know, the subtitle of this panel is how to scale Snapstream. But I'd like to talk about technology in general for a second. And when you gentlemen are reviewing technologies that you're anticipating are going to scale throughout your organization, what are some of those qualities that you're looking for in those technologies that you say, all right, you know, it might be used by this group today, but next year it might be used by, you know, five groups? Who would like to start with that one? Don't everybody jump. Um, <laughs> I'll take it just because I talk. Um, I mean, we, we have a very, and I think probably at any of the large organizations, there's a fairly formal process to evaluate um, new technology. I mean, clearly everyone's always looking and you bring it to the table. And um, in the larger, larger organizations, you, you go through these processes every three to five years-ish of looking at core technology and saying, okay, here is our MAM, here is our PAM, here is our, you know, whatever our media asset management is or any of those pieces. Um, generally, there's a formalized process that says, you know, we want to come look at this. There is a project to replace this, augment, grow, supplement. Um, we have our sourcing division, technology team, IT team, what are the teams, financial guys. And there's a whole group of us that come together and look at what are we trying to do, spec out the requirements, generally put out an RFI of some sort, do an evaluation, generate proof of concept, and ultimately figure out from a financial point, can we afford this? Things we look at, um, the production requirements, you know, does it fulfill the needs? Is it growth future looking? 24 seven redundancy, 365 support from the company, all the things you'd think of in an organization like all the organizations sitting up here. I mean, we're all going all the time. Um, and downtime is very hard when you have a system like ours, you know, Upgrades are challenging to bring the whole system down for an hour is a small act of heaven to find that one hour that you can bring it down and do things. I think the uh, I think an important thing to think about is in today's world when technology jumps out at us so often it is making sure that your users or the people you support um, think it through. You know, it, it's a common theme that we want today simply because we've seen we all act like children at older age because that's who it's being marketed to. So often if, if new te technology crosses my desk and it's coming from a source, whoever it may be, that they've seen it in their friend's feed or something like that, I have to pose the question like, okay, it's great, but what are you gonna use it for? You know, because that's a valid answer to me because you just want it in the building and then it's my job, you know? So you have to prove to me what it's used for. And, and most of the time, if it's not anything that's, if it's anything that's gonna stay around, that reason will be there. If it's anything that's gonna fall by the wayside, that reason generally is not there. And it's a good way for me to just parse through the requests, knowing that, hey, I'd I, I wanna support you, but you know, this is my job too. So it's important that we, you know we're on the same page with that type of stuff. And second, what Adam said, support is probably number one for me. Uh, I've dealt with companies that have a less personalized support aspect, and, and you feel the difference. You know, you feel the difference. Your company happens to be very good at support, and I've dealt with some other ones that are, and some that are not. Um, and that usually shows up after you've made the purchase, unfortunately. Uh, but it's a good thing, it's a good thing for most companies to focus on. So I would say that's number one when I'm looking at stuff. What you said um, before about there being a lot of technologies, um, you know, how has thing, how things changed over the last 5, 10, 15 years? Um, is it, do you think it's a, a good thing that there are more technologies or more almost at the same time, you know, now it's creating additional layers of, um, you know, fluff essentially? I, th yeah. I think, I was just having a discussion with Jeff, who you're familiar with back yeah. then. Um, at how some, some users at our company are cutting the legs off of some of the newer technology and applying it in an older way simply because they're not familiar with the original architecture that is doing exactly what they're using this to do. Um, and I think that that shows up to a greater extent only because the instinct isn't to learn what's going on necessarily, which I understand not everyone has a technical mind or has the desire to, to read into this stuff, but just simply apply what they see. And, and, it, and it, we have a lot of duplication in technology out there simply because they're trying to be first to market 
for the glamorous new way to do things. And I think it does muddy the waters, but in general, it's everything's going in the right direction because the people behind it, I think, are, are sending it the right way. Thank you. Um, I want to speak to you know, some of the things that Dennis Man uh, you know, spoke about with the user experience. I mean, one of the things I try to uh, look for every year and actually enjoy is going to each individual business unit within SNY to sort of gauge what's their pain point, what kind of legacy workflow are they currently doing that you know we might have a solution in place right now mm -hmm. that they just didn't even know existed. Because right, right. again, I mean, you just go through every year and you implement solutions for a particular team. And you know, the, although we're a small organization, sometimes teams can operate in silo. They're kind of worried about sure. what their daily tasks are. So you know, part of one of the things, again, I enjoy is I go to those teams, I sit down with them and sort of like analyze what are areas where you know you have an individual that's doing a particular workflow that the turnover on that employee to get someone else to kind of come in there's a big ramp up on that um, and that's that's sort of like the areas I like to like target when I want to introduce a technology because if the business unit has a large pain point and we know at some point it's affecting the business I can then bring in a piece of a platform or solution that then senior management will be behind. Um, I mean, and it's, it's all about, I try to focus on the user. Um, and that, that's part of like my criteria. Got it, thank you. Well, different than Adam, even though we're a, a big shop, our department is a very small department. So we don't vet out things the same way you do at all in our department. We, we have a use case that comes up or a user that needs to solve a problem and we try and come up with a solution. A couple of those things over, the to over time have turned into these enormous machines, right? So like Snapstream, for instance, as, as one of the things, we were doing off-air records for executives in the sales department on VHS back in the day. This is like, 2000, well, go, going back to the, into the 80s, really, right? But um, finally, Snapstream shows up. And my boss found it in some magazine or something. Look, there's this little thing. Nobody had ever heard of it before. And uh, we're like, well, this is going to solve a lot of problems. So we, we got this little instance of Snapstream. I think we started with a 10-tuner SD system that, with very little amount of storage. Well, over time, more and more people started using this box. And finally, some other users at CBS wanted to use Snapstream. So we were already the people that had been using it for so long. So it's like, oh, let us take care of that for you because we, we know what we're doing already. So instead of you guys reinventing the wheel and having to have some duplication in administration or whatever, we'll just take it over. In our little department, we, we've always been kind of boutique because we, we, you know, we started out with executives and regular non-broadcast people, users. So we're, we can turn very quickly. Now, some of the things have, have grown exponentially, but we can do that with a lot of different technologies. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but we haven't spent a bazillion dollars going into it. So different than you guys, we don't put, not that we don't put any thought into a purchase or whatever, but we can, we can make a small, build a small test rig of whatever it is and see if it works and see how people respond to it. We don't typically go looking for technology and say, hey, you know, does, does somebody want this? We wait until there's a user that, that has, a, has a problem that needs to be solved and then we try and help them solve it. Right. Or push them away from something. We don't want to do that. We know that's not going to or there's no way to deal with it or manage it. Right. So we've kind of come come at most of our, our technology kind of in a, a completely different direction. So so completely agree, and, and I'll tell a little inside baseball story. Our first usage of Snapstream was in my office on a personal machine where I used Beyond TV. The project was at the time, we're going back a lot of years to 2010, 2009 roughly. Um, I was asked to do an analysis of 
secure, proper HD content across the different networks. So we were looking at, as HD was coming in, how much of each of the broadcasts were really doing pure HD content versus wings versus black panels. And so I had to look at all, all the networks and say, geez, they're doing, of their two hour broadcast, they're doing 20 minutes of it. Or of the two hour broadcast, they're doing 13 minutes of it. Or it was a long McGill. It was three months of my life I'll never get back. Um, <laughs> And to your point of how some of these things start, it was literally on an old HP, God, what was it at the time? An XW8400, I think. Um, and with a silicon dust encoder, and I figured out how to get some IP streams in there, and off we went. Um, the interesting question, though, where we ended up was, we started with those, and then it grew organically, as you're describing, and now all of a sudden you're at a system that the entire department or division works, and when we go to move forward off of that, that's where you get into larger processors. Mm -hmm. Things do tend to start kind of organically. So, you know, hey, this is a cool piece of tech. Wow, look at this. And then a couple of people did this. And all of a sudden, people are like, well, how did you get the four HD records of the network? We can't even do that here today. And it's like, well, I figured out if you do this widget plus this widget plus that, off you go. And that has grown into, you know, our system is fairly, I would call it, pretty big. Um, from a storage perspective, we're definitely smaller than you guys from a transcode, record, raw input power, I think we're pretty darn big. No, that's great. Um, and David, I'd like to, you know, go back to you because you were talking about, you know, those small different Snapstream instances and now you're moving more toward a, a centralized system. And can you just kind of walk us through the, when you conceived of this notion of kind of moving everyone from these small siloed systems to a a centralized system. What was your, your thought process like there, and how were you trying to, you know, balance effectively redundancy versus efficiency? Well, um, we've had a couple of small disasters over over the years. Sure. Um, the building losing power for four days kind of hurt and made us realize that redundancy is a very important thing. Luckily, all our snap streams are not in one place. Um, so we were able to then move content over and, and recover. But you know, we have actual clients, not just our own users, that are relying on this. So there was kind of a scramble there. And this is not the broadcast center. We don't have redundant power. You know, we have UPSs, but they're good for, I mean, I didn't even have enough time to power down all the units. You know, there was a fire out in the street, and they said, we're going to cut power. And I had to run to another building to try and get on, on the LAN so that I could power down the servers. And I got about half of them powered down before nothing was responding. Anyway, um, that's a little bit off subject. But that showed us how important redundancy is for that part. So anyway, we had all these different silos that just organically grew. We started with our own. Then another user came in, and the fastest way to get them up and running was to let them borrow ours while we spun up another full instance. So that at that point, we're like, okay, once we get this working, we'll just hand it off to them, and we'll make sure stuff keeps working, and let them be um, you know, their own captains of, of the box. Uh, we did that a couple of different times. And then we got to a point, and, and through all this process, almost all of our clients don't want to throw anything out, right? You know, um, nobody wants to get rid of anything. Uh, so we have all this redundancy going on and our storage is increasing and increasing and increasing. And now, now another show wants to come in and there needs to be another silo built. And the deciders at that point are like, really? Well, how many times are we gonna do this? Are we just gonna keep doing this and doing that? How many, how many records are we making of the same thing? And what I had already wanted to do for a number of years was, can't we consolidate all this? But once you've got somebody up and running, it's not that easy to say, hey, we're gonna change your whole workflows, right? So when we got to that point where here was the tipping point, here was the, the new instance that had to happen, and the money people were like, why would we, why would we buy more of this, you know? We were able to say, look, now's the time. We can start with this as our, as our cornerstone, for a whole new way of doing things, right? We can move all the other users in to one conglomerated cluster uh, with the 
the right user permissions and get rid of all these duplicate records, get rid of all the redundancy. Um, so, so that's what we've been moving towards. And it's, there's so many little details, you know, like on the surface it seems pretty easy, right? Oh, well, just stand this up, everybody gets access to this, and everybody has their own little buckets of stuff that they can deal with on top of it. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that Snapstream has to do to make that happen in a way where users still feel like they're captains of their own ship at the same time. Um, so we're working those out little by little, and we've got a pretty good plan in place, but there's still, there's still some work that Snapstream has to do to help us with that, that they're willing to do. They've been very, you guys have been great with our, your willingness to make all this work. And Thank our so, development team, yeah. Yes. Um, so we're about a quarter of the way, we're, we're almost done with phase one, and then, which is just standing up this, the first cluster in a new environment, um, and then we're gonna start dropping a master node on top and bringing another cluster in and having two completely different groups of users whose streams cannot cross. Like, th that's a big no-no. They can't see what each other is doing at all. Um, even by mistake, you don't want, you don't want that to happen. Um, so, you know, that's when it's going to be scary, when we get to the next step. Sure. And now you've got to, yes, this is going to work, and nobody's going to see anybody else's stuff, but you're all going to be able to see that stuff that everybody gets to see, which is just the raw records of, in these cases, all the news channels, right? There's no reason that everybody can't see those together. Um, and then we can start getting rid of some of this redundancy, of the duplication that we have over and over and over again. I can't get people right now to, Shakira, <laughs> I know you're working on this, uh, to, to delete the overnight, the Anderson Cooper from, you know, two in the morning, that's the same thing he did at, at 9 p.m. Well, what if something's different on it? Like they just, uh, you know. So, it, you know, let, things you know are just exact duplicates. Nobody wants to get rid of anything. So it'll be really nice to say, look, this is everything, this is what you all get. And then moving forward, once we've built this new workflow for, for users, when the next group comes in, that which is what we're trying to do with this, the group we're use, that's going to use this first stack, is this is just be normal for them. Instead of, oh, but we always did it this way, and now you've got to do it this way. No, this is just how it works. You know, So it's, it's as much about changing people's workflows uh, and having them be happy with, nobody wants to change, right? This works, why, do, why would I want to change it? As it is about building a box that'll do things in a better way. Absolutely, so. yeah. Um, Adam, you have a, a centralized system, you know, right now, and, you know, how have, you know, how, how do you balance between redundancy and efficiency, and then can you also talk about kind of just building out those workflows for all of those different users? Sure. Um, the balance is, I guess, a challenge. We went into our system because it was designed to be a feeder system for other things. We actually started with our system with a very hard rule, which you guys are going to laugh about, was we went in wanting to hold two weeks' worth of content. We wanted to, everyone knows what an EVS is, where it kind of eats its tail. We actually wanted our system to do that. So any of the content that isn't, we, we, we kind of did an analysis of what the producers were using and roughly how long content had to be held. And short of a very large, long breaking news story, in which case we have an entire archive system, as you can imagine, we wanted our Snapstream system to hold a minimum of 10 days, maximum of 14 days worth of content. Because we figured that was two weekends worth of spanning producer time. Generally, stories lasted about that long. If they lasted, they could go in, clip, and take it. Um, so we started centralizing. We did have a couple systems. We centralized pretty quickly. Um, the scaling, we found uh, we had a head node very quickly. In fact, I think we might have had one of the first ones um, because we kept hitting it and saying, we need this all to be a single cluster. Um, you know, as David was saying, the guys at Snapstream have been really good for doing development. There are some pieces that have been less than moving forward the way I want them to. Redundancy and failover is one of the big questions for us because as you do look at single clusters, you do have those moment in times that if you have to upgrade or reboot and other things, it's like, okay, so how's Thursday at uh, 11.02 for everybody? And all of a sudden you're frantically breaking down clusters and show squeezes and transcoders and da-da-da-da-da. Um, but it's actually worked pretty well. 
The other interesting thing is that as we've had Snapstream, we have um, a large transcode system. Everyone knows Vantage, Telestream, Flip Factories, all those fun things. Um, we have found a tremendous amount of uses for our system. The biggest one that these guys were great building for us was XDCAM. So very quickly, we need XDCAM 50 as our base record format. Uh, they built us XDCAM stuff that we could record MPEG-2, transcode it internally, or hand it off to our Vantage system, and send it over. Um, you know, I mean, you're going to hear a recurring theme, I think, for most of us, generally, and I'll put words in everybody's mouth, so please jump in, um, that if you bring it to the dev team and there is a business case for it, they will find a way to do it. Um, XDCAM was an obvious one, and a lot of broadcasters said, this is a base AVID format, DNX HD, 145, 220, whatever you were doing. Those types of things, like bring it forward to the team because they're very good at saying, oh geez, I've heard that from seven people now, okay, we'll do it. Um, so we ended up doing a lot of workflows based on that. Our system feeds um, what we call our screening room, which is our publicly available, and I put that in large quotes, uh, the system by which our producers, everybody out on the web can hit our clips in a different retention rate. It is a much lower bit rate. They can go back and screen stuff. As we've gotten more and more workflows, everything from you know, sending clips back and forth to the West Coast, um, screening, the digital team is now coming on board. We just opened it up to a whole bunch of our producers on the digital side who do a lot of news logging for the desks. We have a big, you know, our entire floor is desks, you know, national desk, international desk. Um, the digital desk really wanted it, so we just gave it to a whole bunch of new people because they wanted to be able to go back and look and say, oh, geez, we were watching the CNN feed and I missed what he said. So we want to go roll back two seconds and see, oh, geez, did he really say, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down the wall. Um, sorry, showing my age. What did I miss? Um, I don't know. I think that's great. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm intrigued about these guys because y you've got kind of broadcasting usage, and I'm, I'm intrigued about sports usage. It's a whole different world. Yeah, Gil, if you could, um, I remember the first meeting we had, it was uh, you, me, Eric, and, um, you know, we were kind of discussing different use cases. And can you tell us about, you know, how the system has grown just across different departments? Sure. Um, you know, I think I think what's what's been successful at FCNY with Snapstream, and it's kind of a testament to your developers, has been the ease of use of the platform itself. That's why at SMY it has been such a successful um, sort of like tool for the entire company. Um, almost every single user at SMY has the capability to utilize like Snapstream. And you know, that came about because the moment we started strategizing which groups were gonna have like access to it, it just became inherent that every sort of department had a need to either see the content that we were seeing for QC reasons, or you had our sales team that had no way of really taking in content, sharing it with the agencies to see the elements. Because a lot of times they would have Ford and they want to show the agency, this is this great sort of like campaign that we, you know, this is what your ad dollars are being spent on. Um, and it's also an upsell to Chevy, to all of, so like sales didn't have a workflow in place where they could easily go and share that content off. They'd have to go into our media manager and he was being constantly inundated with pulling clips to burn a DVD. And it wasn't just, the media manager wasn't just doing that for sales. Um, pro, our promos team was being inundated with these sort of like similar requests. Then it came down where you had on-air talent who would regularly go to the media manager and say, I need a clip of such and such, because they would build reels for themselves, right, to promote themselves. Um, you had communications, the communications department, if you had someone who was you know, coming into the studio. So all these sort of like areas had no easy to use platform um, to access this content, this great content that we had. Um, and when we brought Snapstream on board, it was ubiquitous across the company. I mean, and it spread like wildfire um, because of how easily it was to clip a piece of content and then share it to anyone and they could open it from any device. Um, you know, we built it, made, you know, I made sure that when it was being implemented, it was single sign-on on our corporate network so we could easily access the cloud so I had all of the, you know, all of the cloud capabilities. Um, the storage front wasn't too much of an issue for us because, again, what we were really use, utilizing our Snapstream for is, again, to go out to those agencies, for our senior management team to go in and every day kind of QC the content that we are creating and how we can enhance it for the customers. 
Um, now they just regularly go into conference rooms and in their office and literally just sit down on the set-top box and bring up last night's Geico Sports Night. Um, you know, because on top of producing the Mets and Jets, um, we do live content daily at night. And um, it's just kind of refining every piece of content that we do every single day. Um, and it really is just that ease of use. That was why it's been so successful. Um, and again, it's yeah. testament to your development team. You guys did a fabulous job. Yeah, I think the, the changeover from MPEG-2 to H.264 was, was huge for, for that, being able to scale it, because I think there were, you know, a couple pain points, you know, with just adding new users with that web player plugin. I would agree. Yeah. And that, that was a bit, and then again, that made it, you know, we, we, in addition to users accessing it in-house, because we put it on the corporate network, it's also available to them remotely. So we have a lot of users who will sometimes, you know, when Wi-Fi is good, VPN into the network, and either on their iOS device or on their laptop, will be QC and content as they're traveling in. Because again, you'll have a director that sort of, maybe he hired a freelance director that night and he wants to see how Geico Sports Night ran or how Daily News Live ran. And now we have that capability, whereas before, that content was kind of siloed off. He'd have to wait until he came into the office, go into an edit bay, have an AP or a PA pull up that content for him. Great, great. Um, yeah, I would, Dennis, I want to, you know, talk about The Daily Show. Um, you know, Dennis, you've been there. You were there with, with John. Um, you know, The Daily Show has really, you know, revolutionized late night TV, essentially created a, a genre of television. Um, and Dennis, over the years, you know, you've been building this long-term, you know, archive of recordings. Um, anytime I go in to speak with prospective customers, they oftentimes say, well, how does The Daily Show do it? Um, and, you know, it's a very valuable asset that you have. So um, my first question is, you know, would you consider selling it today to the highest bidder? Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, yeah Jeff says yeah. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> monetization, excellent. I free. I buy the cake. You don't need it. You got Bitcoin. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but no, you know, it's a very valuable asset. And how do you, you know, protect that asset? You know, that's a the protection of it is difficult. You know, I, I bring I brought Jeff into that because he's who I work most closely. He actually inherited uh, that responsibility from someone that went on to work for Oliver and Sam B and all that stuff. Um, but David, to your question, the, the the we have an agreement where Jeff and some other people maintain those overnights because the repeat viewing showings are are like cancer to this Snapstream system. I mean, the channels need to broadcast everything, and you're caught in this middle point where uh, you need to record 24-7 for breaking news, uh, but breaking news isn't all the time yet. I mean, I'm sure we're moving towards nonstop breaking news, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, but protecting the asset is, is difficult because um, hardware, I'm relying on hardware. And, right. and hardware is inherently faulty. I mean, that, that's its job. Its job is to work until it can't work anymore. Um, like any other piece of hardware you're familiar with, a car, a phone, an oven, it all works the same way. It's all made of mechanical parts that will fail at some point. So it's, uh, it's sort of like racing the clock. Um, and the only thing to do with that and to not let costs grow exponentially you know, although hardware storage costs are coming down and, and size is going up and, and all that's working in a, in a good inverse rate, um, is to sit down with the people who are relying on it and explain this concept to them. Um, and, you know, early on in my, in my time at The Daily Show, you know, I was brought on almost immediately after the important decisions were made which is always fun for when you get to a job and you're faced with that. Uh, so then my, my job is then to, you know, manage, the, manage these, these decisions. Um, so it's after the fact of making people realize that the, the, the desire to keep everything is, is very natural, but the ability to do it is, is very difficult. Um, so now, as you well know, we're, we're, we're trying to transcode off of this stuff. And, and, and I think maybe in like 2013, we pose, it was posed, you know, my inclination in my training is, you know, what about redundancy? You know, it's very important in the IT world. Um, and I kept looking at that redundancy and just seeing duplication 
as my only possible solution and the price tag of duplication is exactly what you paid for the first system which is there's a lot of money invested in this system and now you're going to invest in it twice for the potential of it all going away in one fell swoop for footage that may or may not ever be used. And when you come to my company, which is we produce one show, we are not a, 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 a conglomeration of anything, the financial responsibility is very difficult you know, to do that. Um, so then you get out the word that, yo, if there's a fire in this room or, or this building blows up, this is gone. Uh, and they say, no, that can't be. And then you say, to not do it that, it's going to cost this. And then it's, let's hope there's never a fire in this room. <laughs> you know, it, it's just the way of, of, of the business. So the best thing that we can do is, thankfully, I have a guy like Jeff to help me manage this and make some hard decisions. A lot of it is people don't want to make the decisions because uh, then the responsibility falls on them. I have no problem with that, uh, which I, I, I consider an asset for me in my position. But if you explain it enough to people, they do understand, you know? So, so going to H.264 is huge. We're now resing everything over to H.264, moving off of some archival systems to a different archival system. And the hope is, you know, now I just stay on top of it. And every so odd years, the technology will increase. But now once I get the file size down to H.264, it's at least manageable. And going ahead, telling my users there have to be some limitations and you have to work with me here on this is important. And, and I think I've gotten to a spot where the people that make the decisions are willing to support those decisions that, that they've made. And, and once you get a couple people on board like that, uh, the explanation becomes that much easier. And you pray that there's not another fire in that room, which we had once already. So. Thank you. Um, you know, I just got the, the two-minute warning. Um, let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, you know, one thing that the future holds, obviously, is the push to the cloud. That's coming out a lot. And then also, you know, I'd be interested in, in what you guys have seen. You know, like, what's the biggest new tech that you've seen in the last 12 months um, in media technology? Count backwards by 12. Um. Every company is looking at cloud. Every broadcast company thinks the cloud is both its greatest friend, asset, and the biggest devil spawn. I mean, you know, you can't sure. sit there and look at it and say, oh my god, it doesn't have a complete double-edged sword. Um, from a Snapstream perspective, one of the things that I think is interesting is some concept of hybridization, where you could have replication, federation, um, you know, a core system in one place and, you know, subsets in other places, maybe core media, tagged and moved off. Um, you know, virtualization is obviously a big issue and a big question for a lot of us. And it's a very different conversation to virtualize a desktop at a trading floor where you're pushing numbers sure. versus virtualizing media space. You know, 60 frames a second is really hard to do in virtualization. Technically not even possible in the moment. Um, so, you know, you get a lot of challenges. And then you get a lot of format challenges. We're 720p. You guys are... 1080, 1080. Same you're 1080. So they're 30 frames a second. We're 60. You're 60. We're, you're we're doing almost all our Snapstream stuff 720. So you're 720, 60. So so even you got a great division right here. This table is a 720p. This is 1080i. Um, you know, so there's a lot of questions. I mean, there are always directional desires, and you know, Aaron will sit there and laugh and say, "Half his roadmap is things I said we've got to go this way." Um, I think hybridization is the next big thing for for the Snapstream systems. I think the ability to make that open more, single sign-on, all those types of things. Uh, coolest tech? That's a hard one. Uh, you know, I, look, there's a lot of really cool tech. I got to tell you, and this is kind of the joke that, you know, anyone in broadcast, go back a couple years, remember when we had $100,000 cameras? Remember when the lenses were thirty, fifty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000? You had to carry on huge packs, and you had to send out a team to shoot. Um, anyone realize that this little thing has more power to record and transmit than those packs ever did and could single-handedly in a producer's hand overwhelm any system you have. So now every producer has this in their hand as they walk out the door and these formats, as we all jokingly say, are the bane of our existences. Um, so I think quite honestly, the I think probably one of the biggest technologies that's probably come into its own in the last 12 months, I would say bonded cellular, personally. 
okay. think the fact that we went from having to require satellites and BGANs and KU bands and C bands, it's not like we don't use this anymore and we're breaking news, so we're a little bit different than this. But the fact that a producer can go and pop this into Periscope or broadcast back on anything and we have ex acceleration now to get things back. Um, personally, I think bonded cellular and the ability to get that latency down from a broadcast perspective is very interesting. Great. No, that's great. Um, anyone else want to add anything? Well, I, I, I think uh, what, what may be exciting in, in our realm of live sports is just seeing sort of the lift off of video IP delivery of live sports events, like getting to the future where a Met game, we can start delivering that over IP, obviously because of costs. I mean, right. you know, having a truck and satellite uplinks, I mean, those are huge costs. And in an area where we're at, we're in RSN, and you're seeing the level of disruption that sort of like regional sports networks and just tel television networks as a whole, um, getting to the point where you can deliver the video live sports events in scale uh, reliably um, around the world or just you know within your territory I think it's just an exciting thing for me because again like sure. I'm excited to sort of like see all the areas within broadcasting that you know you, you sort of look around and there are many single points of failures um, devices that just have no automation a lot of like barriers of entry where it's kind of like specialized and it's not technically like specialized like engineering wise but you just look at it and it's got one power supply hooked up into it and you, you go in and you work with the engineers, and you're like, that's how you're doing the workflow? And it's like, you're just seeing that that's where things are going. And you know, er, you know companies like Google are already doing it for their live events. Mm -hmm. It's just now it needs to go into the area of live sports. Right. Um, we're dipping our toes slowly, mm -hmm. but you know, my VP knows that that's where we have to go because that's an area that we know we can cut costs. Um, and if we could deliver it reliably to, to the masses, um, it's going to be good for the business. No, that's great. Um, you know what, I was just given the stop signal, but I would like to take a couple questions, um, if anyone has any questions for our panelists. Hi, well, Matt. Yes, Bob. I mean, I like Bob, but... <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this isn't necessarily just for this panel, maybe the previous panel as well. What I'm hearing is that you folks have trouble getting hold of staff that can operate Snapstream, and, and it would really help you actually find people that could hit the ground running. Is there anything that Snapstream can do to kind of help you out? I'm, I'm not talking about necessarily a dating agency, but <laughs> I know we're in a few journalism schools or in some other universities. Is there anything we can do to, to get you people that are able to use Snapstream right out of the box? I would actually throw that question around to say, from, from people who work in broadcast, is it really that hard? Because any producer worth their salt who works in Avid or Premiere or anything else, Snapstream is... I mean, a 10 second thing, 30? <laughs> Part of what we loved about it was that the user interface was really cool. I would argue that your buttons might try to be a little clearer and you know, we can change the iconography, but I mean, please, anyone sitting up at this panel, like any of our producers, if I show it to them for all of two minutes, that's about as long as I have to teach them, okay. usually. Yeah, I don't think the difficulty is in the teaching of the, of the, the application itself. But, and I don't think you're ever going to be able to teach the understanding of the application on the environment. You know, at least from our standpoint, that's where we come from. But if you give a producer the ability to do anything that they want to do, they'll see that and that's it. You know, and, that, and that's just, that just is unteachable. But, but I will say there are pieces that really do need some work. And I think the administration portions absolutely do. And I think as we look forward to the more complex the systems get and the larger and the more pieces, one of the things that we've lost as we've gone into the new Snapstream technologies is we used to have a really nice interface to administer all the tuners in one spot. The cluster, you could do everything. Now that you have encoders here, another type of encoder here, tuners here, there is no central UI anymore. You literally have to go to a box, a box, a box, a box, a box. And then you get into certain areas that are centralized, like, OK, I can designate these incoming streams as globals. Um, that's where the challenges come. Things like managing records and seeing conflicts. As we start having more and more channels and more and more streams and all those things, mm -hmm. we need much better tools to be able to visualize that very quickly. Because it's no longer a limitation of the tuner allocation. Mm -hmm. It is like, oh geez, my you know, 26th tuner is going to throw out my 25th one. And, you know, there's no way to visually see very quickly 
from a record perspective, here's a quick way to see what's going to conflict. Sure. Yeah, and David, I know you you know brought this up as well, so if you'd like yeah, to expand yeah, on that. that. And yeah. also just being able to see all my tuners at once, or, or even to say, I want to see what's on tuner X. Not, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't, there's no easy way to do that. There really isn't. And it seems, it seems like it, such an obvious thing. I know it's not as easy as, as it sounds, but you know, you have to all the, you have to go through a whole process to do that when it should just be, what's on tuner 26, you know? Sure. Oh, there it is. It's working. It's not. Yeah, sure. No. Well, yeah, hopefully, you know, we're, we're hearing you guys loud and clear, and hopefully, you know, 2018 and beyond, you know, we can address some of these. Um, Another question in the back. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, I love to pick up on the term tuner, and one, I've used Snapstream in two different environments. Okay. And it's an amazing listening tool to the world. And as the world moves past linear cable or broadcast to social media video, to text, to Netflix, Hulu, Vimeo, et cetera, how does, how do you all in your environments think about a listening post beyond the tuner? And how does the company think about providing its clients with that same power in media that like podcast is a whole thing and there's so much media happening, so much conversation happening. Are you looking to other forms of media to apply this same rubric of listening, slicing, tagging, clipping, and sharing? Yeah, I mean, I would probably echo. Do you mind giving your background? Like you mentioned, you use Snapchat. Oh yeah, I I tell jokes. I used to work at the Daily Show with Dennis and Jeff. I used to work at the Onion. I'm on my own now. I do writing. I'm a multimedia human, and so I love Snapstream. I'm like, oh, that's a superpower. But now I want it in other domains. Like we've conquered, you've conquered a world, but there are more worlds than these. So I'm curious as how you think about that. Yeah, we, we talked earlier about how we take in RT, other IP streams now right. as, uh, as sources, uh, but we can only take in the IP sources that are available to us. Um, so we take in UDP, uh, RTMP, we're adding HLS and Peg Dash and one that's coming out next month. But that's a, that's a focus for us. So somebody that's doing an over-the-top live broadcast channel can now you know, uh, basically send that to two places to their, their CDN that's pushing it out to the rest of the world, and they can send it to Snapstream where they can record it and live clip it uh, and you know do all the things you can do with live streams in Snapstream, but from this IP stream. But does that mean that we can you know take in YouTube vid YouTube videos or you know something that's airing on Netflix or you know Hulu Live that came up in here earlier? I don't know if that's what they call it, but uh, but they're pushing out live channels through, through Hulu. Uh, and we don't have support for those right now. And re probably getting support for those would involve going to those um, those like over the top providers and striking deals with them because those are all you know access controlled streams. So so not that easy. Tech you know technically is it's not really a technical problem. It's more of a licensing problem when it comes to capturing some of those over the top over the top streams. But it's certainly it's definitely on our radar. We we've gone into customers and they've said they've asked us. Hey, why, why don't you record Netflix? I don't even think they know what they want, but uh, but they want oh, yeah, they, do. They, want, they want House of Cards. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> they want House of Cards. Don't kid yourself. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah. So, definitely think question? about that. Maybe one more question. Anyone? Uh, all right. I'm sitting up here, so you're challenged. <laughs> all right. I guess we'll leave it there. Well, how about a round of applause for our um, panelists?